Dry Scrubber Users Association virtual webinar. I'm Jerry Hunt. I'm the DSUA president. Um, I want to thank everyone for registering and participating. If you're a DSUA veteran, you've uh, been to the conference, been participating in the past, appreciate you guys coming back to join us. If this is your first time being involved with DSUA, appreciate you guys, you know, coming and checking us out. And hopefully we'll see you guys more involved in the future going forward. So those not familiar with DSUA, the overall intent, this is a nonprofit organization and the intention here is just ultimately sharing knowledge on dry scrubbers amongst the end users, the, the vendors, the folks in the industry, as well as overall provide a platform to network and connect folks in the dry scrubber industry. Um, you know, we, this is, again, this is our first virtual webinar. So, um, I'm sure there may be some bugs and we appreciate everyone's patience and certainly encourage everyone's feedback on how we can always make this better going forward. Cause, um, we expect we'll be doing more of these virtual conferences in 2020. Um, typically we're, we'd normally be about a couple weeks out from having an in-person conference. And this is the first time since 2008 that that's not going to happen, obviously due to COVID-19. So. Um, it's kind of forced the association to pivot and, you know, we wanted to still be relevant and provide value to the industry. So we developed these webinars and again, this is the first. So, um, so, you know, please stay tuned and, you know, check out the website and, you know, the, the dry scrubber users has a LinkedIn profile. We'll provide updates on the future webinars going forward. And again, certainly your guys' feedback will be extremely valuable. So uh, there, if you go to the Dry Scrubbers website, you can you can send any feedback, comments, questions after this uh, this webinar is over, and we'll be happy to. We certainly appreciate it. So, uh, as far as the format today, so everyone has an idea of what's going on. Um, you know, just it was a brief intro as to kind of what DSUA is about. I want to keep it kind of brief. Most of you guys are familiar with it. Uh, anyone that wants to know more, again, more than happy to reach out to us through the website and, and talk one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I'll introduce our moderator from Gecko is, is Dave Kahn. We've got two presentations today, uh, as indicated. Unfortunately, uh, Wes Painter from Eastman Chemical isn't able to give his presentation, but he is still on the, the webinar and available to do some Q&A, but he's just not able to give a presentation. So we've got a little bit more time for uh, for the other folks to talk. Um, we're going to hold off on all Q&A until after the presentation, so feel free to send questions in through the, you can type them in at the, the bottom of your screen and send them on. Our, our moderators watching will be happy to answer some questions. Um, feel free if you have a specific question for any one of our speakers, again, even, even Wes, um, feel free to ask any specific questions to those folks. But if you have a, a general question that you think would be valuable to listen to, you know, hear a response from all of the all of the end users on this call that are participating. Um, you know, these folks would be happy to answer. Just just let us know. And uh, if by any chance we run out of time, we're not able to answer your questions. Uh, we'll do our best to follow up and get some written responses and post those later. So the intent here is we want to be respectful of everyone's time. We know everyone's super busy. We appreciate your participation. Um, but at the same time, I want to make sure we answer all your questions. So, um, you know, stay tuned on that. If your question didn't get answered, we'll, we'll follow up. And just for everyone's sake, um, you know, maybe some folks aren't able to participate. Uh, feel free to spread the word. Let folks know that this is going to be, this is being recorded right now. We plan to promptly post it up on the website for free viewing. You know, if you want to view it again or share it with other folks, we encourage you guys. It'll, it'll be up through the website. Um, I do want to take a quick moment to thank all the, the folks on the DSUA board. Um, these guys are all, these folks are all volunteers um, that kind of stepped up and are giving a lot of their time to help, you know, make this successful. And this year was kind of above and beyond a little bit extra uh, given the whole webinar instead of a conference. Um, Travis Reynolds, he's our, he's our vice president. Um, he stepped up. Um, Matt Devitt did a, did a lot of work for us last year. And unfortunately Matt had to step down a couple weeks ago and Travis has stepped up and, and Travis has definitely been instrumental in helping kind of pull together this, uh, this virtual webinar. Um, Craig Henry is one of our speakers today. He's our secretary and always providing us pretty valuable feedback from the end user perspective, which is, which is greatly needed. And, uh, Sean Ver Verink is, um, he's our treasurer. Uh, he's got the, the thankless role in the background. There's a lot of work that goes with the treasurer and keeping the books and handling payment and dealing with all that stuff. And, and Sean's been a veteran to DSUA, so certainly we've leaned on him with a with a lot of questions, you know, how things have been done in the past. 
And, and then certainly we have other directors. Uh, Wes Painter from Eastman has also been a director. Kurt Bean from Mississippi Lime. And Dave Kahn stepped up when we had an extra um, position become available, and, and Dave's taken on a director role. And Dave's always kind of continued to help us in the background, you know, anyway. So, um, again, a big thank you to all those guys. Everyone's just giving their time to try and make this uh, informative and valuable for everyone. And um, so, yeah, thank you to all the, the board members. Um, one last little uh, plug for DSUA, uh, you know, as folks want to get more involved, obviously, whether it's the end users, vendors, um, just get engaging you guys and keeping things going. I think the value in these webinars is it's going to keep us hopefully engaged and continuing doing this, you know, talking about DS DSUA throughout the year instead of just the typically the September conference. But if you want to get involved with sponsorship and the webinars, um, certainly reach out to us. There's, a, there's always still opportunities for that. And if you're someone that, you know, is interested in getting access and, and being, a, being a member, which would give you access to the archive so that on the DSUA website, we have all the presentations that have been given since 2008. So if you pay for access to, for a membership, you get a calendar, your access, you can pull all the historical presentations and um, you know, if that's something you're interested in, you have questions about, um, we're happy to answer that for you guys as well. And certainly if you want to participate by um, providing some content for interested in potentially providing content for a future webinar, um, feel free to reach out to us through the DSUA website. As I mentioned, we're going to be doing more of these webinars. Um, so, you know, send us a web, send us an email, a uh, brief abstract, or just, just connect with us and we'll be happy to get back to you one-on-one. -on -one. And, uh, um, you know, kind of talk a little bit more about future content and uh, gladly to review any abstracts for future consideration. Um, wanted to start by acknowledging our sponsors. Hoping everyone can see my screen here. So certainly we can't do this without our sponsors. I think, um, you know, with the conferences, we always have, they're always supported by our sponsors, our, you know, all the registrants, folks who've attended, um, that kind of helps fund DSUA being a nonprofit. And, uh, you know, I, I, an extra special thank you to our sponsors this year, because, um, you know, not having a conference, it's, it's tough to, you know, send in, uh, to continue to generate revenue, to keep the association going. And we, we want to continue this for several years to come. So, uh, a big thank you. A lot of these sponsors are, are kind of stepped up to support these webinars and help DSUA. So kind of an extra special thank you to the to these sponsors. So um, Gecko Robotics is, is one of these, uh, one of our sponsors. Uh, they use revolutionary robotic technology for industrial infrastructure inspections. They have wall climbing robots uh, that perform inspections via their teams, their NDT inspections across the globe. Um, the robots enable industrial companies to carry out regular inspections and capture data at high speeds uh, and, and scale that exists, existing manual methods are being capable of while minimizing the need for human exposure in hazardous environments. I know these guys have given multiple presentations throughout the years uh, at DSUA. So hopefully you guys are familiar with them. Uh, Leckler nozzles. Uh, Leckler's been around for over 140 years, designing and manufacturing spray nozzles, instrumental and, and spray dryer absorbers uh, used for air quality control. They've got a wide range of nozzles, nozzle lances, valve stands, uh, mist eliminators. So they're providing all sorts of solutions for gas cooling and purification, as well as dentrification and desulfurization of flue gas. So um, any application, they've got something for you. They, you know, um, advise customers on, you know, specific solutions that you need for mission requirements and they've got a lot of in-house expertise. So, um, they're interested in partnering with you. So feel free to, you know, reach out to Leckler if this is something that you've got questions on nozzles. Um, LAWAS North America is a subsidiary of the LAWAS Group. It's a global limestone, lime, hydrated lime, and, and silicate minerals company. They supply high-quality calcium-based products, including the Sorbicel SP, SPS, enhanced hydrated lime products to neutralize acid gases and, and flue, gas, um, flue gas generated from combustion or other industrial processes. Uh, LAWAS sorbents are applied across numerous industries, including fossil, waste energy, power generation, cement, glass, pulp and paper, and chemical manufacturing, uh, just to name a few. 
Mississippi Lime, they are also uh, similar to Lawas. They're a world-class producer of calcium products, including quick lime, hydrated lime, and calcium carbonate. They've been around for over 100 years, producing products from one of the richest limestone reserves in the world. And today supplies products throughout North America and the world from over 12 plants and terminals. High quality quick lime and hydrated lime are cost effective products for dry scrubber and dry sorbent injection applications. National Filter Media, um, they take pride in being the world's oldest and largest providers of air pollution control and liquid filtration products. NFM has achieved success by adhering to the same business principles they practiced since the firm was founded in 1906. They believe in building partnerships with customers and earning their businesses every day. Um, while, while filtration technologies have changed since 1906, their commitment remains the same and they wanna be long-term partners with their customers at the end of the day. Reaction Analytical Solutions Corporation. They're specialized in providing engineering solutions using computational fluid dynamic or CFD modeling. The founder, Dr. Guisu Liu, he's worked in the field of fuel combustion and emission control industry for over two decades and has provided over 100 CFD-based engineering design and optimization services to utilities, engineering firms, as well as industrial owners. His modeling experience covers from front-end furnace combustion to back-end flue gas treatment systems. Um, the unique technical specialties of the CFD modeling include a variety of chemical chemistry modeling, as well as how to maximize the mixing between chemicals and for flue gas and flue gas for optimizing utilization. Uh, recently, they've used specialized CFD to help end users find cost savings optimization solutions for sorbent injection systems for all sorts of acid gases, as well as mercury control. So those are just some of our uh, sponsors. You know, I wanted to give you a little bit of background. Again, we can't do this without them, but they're just to name a few, uh, Carton, Fujikin, as well as I, you guys have heard about, uh, I spoke to you about Gecko, um, you know, Graymont, Hydrated Lime, uh, as well as one of our sponsors, Leckler and Lawast, Mississippi Lime, NFM. Omega Atomizers also stepped up, um, RPM Solutions, Reaction Analytical Solutions, and US Lime. Uh, again, I can't say enough thank you, and definitely wanted to take a few minutes while everyone early on in this just to acknowledge them for everything they're doing to help help out this year. And um, and, and certainly if uh, anyone wants to know a little bit more about these sponsors and, and what they've contributed and what they can contribute to the dry scrubber industry, certainly go to the DSUA website. If you scroll down, you'll see their logos. If you click on their logo, you'll be able to go to their homepage so you can find out more information about them. And as well as feel free to always send emails to DSUA through our contact us tab on our website. And we're happy to help connect you guys and answer any questions you have. And if you want to know anything more about sponsorship, again, feel free to visit our website. All right, so with that, um, I wanted to introduce our moderator, Dave Kahn from Gecko Robotics. Dave is a director at Gecko Robotics. And those of you that are familiar with um, DSUA and have attended, you've, you've seen Dave multiple times. Dave's been a long time participant and with DSUA uh, giving talks and, and Dave's been involved in the board when I started, Dave was a vice president uh, on the current board at the time, and you know Dave's been ac always actively engaged in, in DSUA. And even when he stepped away from the board um, last year, uh, you know he's always stayed involved and, and been an active supporter of helping us uh, offline. So again, big thank you to Dave. And uh, I'm going to turn this over to Dave, and he's going to be your moderator for today's um, DSUA SDA webinar. All right, Dave, go ahead, take it away. Appreciate it, Jerry. Hey, hey welcome, everybody. welcome, everybody. Um, so our first speaker is going to be John Kirsch. We probably all know John. He's uh, a, a lifer, if you will. A uh, quick bio on John. 37 years in the power industry, working in uh, mainly in construction, capital upgrades, uh, performance improvements, and maintenance. Uh, he's been an attendee since uh, 2007, a BSME from Lehigh. Uh, he has three sons who are Eagle Scouts and engineers. He's an avid golfer and a space buff, and a diehard Phillies and Eagles fan. So, I think we've seen a slide or two from John in the past on uh, on his sports affiliation and his uh, his love for space. But without further ado, I'll kick it over to John Kirsch. All right. All right. 
Everybody see me all right? Yeah, it looks really good, John. Uh, okay. Have at it. Okay, we'll go. All right, guys, I'm uh, JK, uh, batting leadoff today for the for the conference. And uh, at NACE, uh, we always start out with a uh, with a safety moment. And uh, since I can't get any feedback, I'm assuming that we're getting a laugh out of this. But uh, it's something that uh, NACE has done, uh, like many power plants, just be very cautious while you're out there in the plant. And uh, keep moving on here. Um, many of you already know that uh, Logan and Carney's Point are the last two coal plants in the uh, state of New Jersey. And Logan's affectionately known as the uh, flagship and Carney's is the fire chip. And the way we're set up now, we, we share a lot of resources uh, between the, the two plants, uh, engineering, ops, maintenance, and we're just eight miles apart there along the Delaware River. And for me, that's pretty convenient because I can get to either plant pretty quickly from uh, Wilmington. Um, house divided, that's kind of a, a joke, but uh, you can see the uh, pirate ship and the, the, the flagship side, and it's always uh, going up there to the flagship or going down to the pirate ship. So guys have a lot of fun with that. All right, here's uh, the layout of of Carney's, you can see it's a pretty uh, compact uh, plant. Uh, we're on part of the Camores uh, DuPont site, um, and we're a dual boiler setup, two bag houses, two scrubbers, you know, common line prep and uh, ash systems. And let's get to the uh, important stuff here uh, 249. Um, net capacity we actually just passed our uh, pjm capacity test for the summer yesterday we have two foster wheeler front wall fire boilers there's eight burners in each boiler we have two joy niro scrubbers with the f800 atomizers and two 10 compartment bag houses um, two drum slakers uh, with uh, slurry tanks to go with them and only a single uh, recycle ash uh, system which on occasion has caused us issues not having multiple systems where we have to go on all line this is a different design than up the road at logan where they have two lime slurry tanks and two recycle ash systems and there's our standard so2 emissions that we have to comply with logan is a little bit different uh, Carney's has a longer averaging period. And of course, DuPont Camores is our uh, steam host right next door. So what what happened uh, since last year? Well, our bag house is continuing to deteriorate, still doing some uh, patching and some bag replacement. And this is common for uh, both plants. Um, continue to have some bag and uh, hangar failures and uh, we keep track of all that stuff to see if we can uh, find any trends that are uh, moving along with the, uh, the bag house and stay ahead of it. Um, still have the issue at both plants with uh, running at very low load, uh, our line valves being able to, to control without cycling too much. Um, continue to have on occasion uh, recycle ash uh, shortages. Um, and both plants are continuing to monitor the uh, moisture of the ash as we try to run at a, a very low approach temperature. Uh, one of the projects we did this year at Carney's was to automate the slakers uh, with the lime slurry tank level. So those just kick off uh, automatically whenever they're needed. Uh, this uh, project is still in the books, but uh, we've postponed it again. We've been able to keep up so far with uh, the recycle systems. Um, made a change. You'll see some pictures later on our slaker vent piping um, to improve the uh, working atmosphere inside of the uh, lime slido slaker area. We also did a, a lime slurry tank mixer upgrade, which uh, we had done previously up at Logan to great success. Of course, the flagship did it first, but now uh, 
the pirate ship is catching up. One of the big issue I think a lot of plants, uh, especially on the coal side, are having is uh, continued employee retention. Um, we continue to lose employees, but we also have gained back uh, some guys that had left the sites and have now come on back to help us get to the end. Uh, so we've been really lucky in that regard. Also, some major uh, plants in the Philly area that have uh, shut down that uh, we've been able to get operators from. So we've we've managed to keep our guys here. So we're we're really lucky in that regard. Um, nothing has changed with our uh, contract. Um, the plants are under four years left, uh, and when that time is up. Uh, the plants will be torn down. Uh, we continue to utilize uh, outside engineering support, whether it be on the uh, INC side with contractors. Primex is uh, still under contract with us for uh, both plants to support and uh, monitor the scrubber operation. And, you know, as a result of that, we, we do combine reporting and uh, review of uh, the operation of the plants. Uh, and this is the first year where the plant's bonuses are not separate. We are one big happy family now. So if both plants do well, we'll all do well on a bonus. But if they don't, then we're going to go down together. Um, continuing to get uh, data out of our uh, PLC network that uh, we put in place, I think it was after the conference last year. And so now that's opened up. Uh, access to a lot more information to help uh, troubleshoot the plants operating issues. Um, we've got another project to uh, have the operators go around and uh, again obtain data that we couldn't get any other way. And we're continuing to uh, look at testing uh, scrubbers uh, at the outlets with another set of uh, dew point meters. Okay, so here's a very fuzzy picture, but it kind of gives you an overall uh, view of the entire uh, bag house. You can see on the right side there where the inlet duct is. And the doors um, are all on the exterior of the uh, uh, bag house. And you can see we, we continue to monitor. That's why all the different symbols. Here's kind of a blow up shot of that so you can get a, a sense of, you know, in May and in June, you know, we are continuing to have issues. A lot of it seems to be centered around the doors, you know, where the, even though they're, the areas are insulated, uh, they tend to be a little bit colder. Um, still having uh, some bag failures, especially in uh, bag house number two. And Logan is having similar issues. You'll see some shots coming up here. Um, see the flagship is uh, kind of falling apart. Uh, you can see where the meter there is at the doorway. Those are actually uh, holes, uh, you know, where it's corroded uh, the compartment. And of course, that leads to outside air coming in. Um, the right-hand picture where you see the blue circles around it, you can see those are cracks between actually compartments, the, uh, the outlet uh, dampers. Um, are common at that point. You can see, uh, you know, we're having these, these are again from Logan, but we have similar problems at Carney's. But uh, what you're seeing there is uh, they put the, the coating on in, in two sections. You know, they blast, they put the first layer of the coating in red, and then they do an overlay of that uh, with a gray so that they can make sure that they have uh, coverage. And you can see here, you know, that both coatings are now starting to to lift. Uh, <clears throat> Logan still has some uh, cat bags in place, and as those fail, they are replacing them with the uh, the, the capless uh, bag design. Uh, Carney's, both bag houses at Carney's have completely gone to the capless bags. So when we uh, started <clears throat> going out to, to get our PJM testing done, um, you know, we noticed there were some issues here out at the ID fan. You can see that uh, the lagging is completely deteriorated. You know, we have uh, issues on the outlet uh, 
of the ID fans headed up to the stack. And uh, you can see shot looking up here at the silencers that they're starting to deteriorate as well. And then even uh, the turning vanes uh, coming into the fans. Now, uh, when I first uh, worked an outage down at Carney's back in 2006, this was all brand new uh, ductwork turning vanes that was all coated in a shop and shipped to the site and they re completely ripped out all of the uh, ductwork between the bag house and the fans. And now here we are, you know, 14 years later and it's starting to fail. Um, guys, here's uh, a drying curve that uh, a copy of this is in the control room. And <clears throat> it's what the uh, operators refer to should they uh, lose uh, recycle flow. And, you know, based on those temperatures, they will back the, uh, you know, the approach temperature off if we uh, lose recycle for any period of time. And then that hopefully will keep the bags from getting wet and accelerating the deterioration in the bag house. Uh, I think I mentioned before we are continuing to monitor uh, the ash uh, moisture. And this is uh, kind of a typical feedback that we'll get from uh, Primax in our monthly uh, meetings. And, you know, you can see the observ on the left-hand side, you can see the observations and uh, some recommended actions based on that. <clears throat> Trying to correlate, you know, some of the issues we're seeing with uh, uh, recycle ash flow in the bag house. Um, we also have a, uh, a storm probe, as we call it, uh, to do some manual ash sampling, uh, you know, from the flue gas stream that uh, we going to try out here shortly. Um, here's the monitoring going on up at Logan. And, and one big difference between the two plants, and you'll see some slides later, the uh, cone section of the scrubbers, uh, it is filled in at uh, Carney's. Uh, they removed the uh, delumper at the bottom way early in the, in the operation of the plant. Same thing happened at Logan, but at Logan, um, there's a flue gas research system and uh, the bottoms of the scrubber there are kept clear. So hence the, uh, what they call wall falls, uh, drop it out in the scrubber and then they clean it out of a hopper at the, at the bottom. So they've been tracking that for us for, uh, you know, for, for uh, over a year now. And again, we're trying to correlate, you know, what's going on inside of the scrubber with uh, the ash that's falling out. Okay, SO2 emissions up the road there. You can see uh, the target limit there is uh, 0.15. And we're running at Logan, we're running uh, quite a bit below that. So, you know, that's still opportunity to uh, try and improve the operation of the unit that uh, we're going to continue to look at. And down the road here at Carney's Point, same emission limit, and you can see that we're uh, running a little bit closer to where that is. The uh, uh, operators are doing a good job here. And then same thing on uh, recycle ash, you can see, you know, we're targeting, you know, up in the low 40s uh, for percent solids. And uh, we have done recently, we've done quite a bit, you know, better getting good ash uh, transport and, and um, everyone who has been associated with uh, dry scrubber for a while knows that recycle ash is key to reducing your uh, lime slurry demands. Okay, so here's a side view of the scrubber at, at Carney's and this continued buildup uh, in ash. Um, we had some guys look into the uh, uh, cones when we had outages earlier this year of us were working from home and there's a shot of the buildup inside the scrubber and everybody has remarked they have never seen that much uh, buildup inside of the cones and of course the big unknown there is how much can that build up how much weight you know can the cones take and that's leading us to uh, want to uh, UT and inspect the uh, walls of the scrubber to uh, make sure that uh, we're, we're going to make it to the end of the run. 
here's a shot inside of the inlet duct. You can see those are the inlet dampers. Uh, Carney's has two inlet dampers per compartment. Uh, Logan just has one. And then here's a little tighter shot inside of there. And you can see that's compartment 2-4. And you can see in the kind of lower right there where that compartment has started to corrode away, you know, right there where the damper is. And you come in from the outside and you strip the insulation and lag, and that's what you have. So there's another, you know, source of air coming into the, uh, the unit. And typically what we've done is just patch that right up with plate, um, maybe hit it with some uh, rust grip coating and then get back in service. So I mentioned that uh, we had uh, the dual um, goals for the, for the plants uh, and we are running uh, in good shape both plants for our calcium to, to sulfur target. Um, see Logan just recently bumping up a little bit and Carney's, you know, staying on the, on the, on the lower end of uh, what our targets are. And so this translates into savings and that translates into making bonus goals. So, all right. Um, the lime slurry uh, operation has been, uh, has been good at the pirate ship. You know, we're making good slurry in the uh, horizontal retention slakers. And that just has continued to uh, operate well for the whole time. And up, at, up the road at the flagship, uh, they're getting better. Um, those are vertical slakers up the road. And uh, we are continuing to uh, look for opportunities to uh, run better, but uh, pretty decent reactivity. Um, one thing that we've done here at Carney is because you only have the single atomizer in, in each uh, scrubber. Uh, anytime you get an opportunity uh, to go change out the hoses, you know, from build up, we take advantage of it. If the unit trips for some other reason than the uh, atomizer, they're ready to run up there and, and change out the hoses. They keep a ready supply of, you know, prefabricated hoses to the right length. So it's a pretty, pretty quick and easy process. Okay. Um, two point transmitters. Here's a overhead shot. Um, and uh, I played this slide before um, that the original Two point transmitters that were put in were could only be used in a clean environment, and they were at the outlet of both bag houses. And because we have single scrubbers, you know, we were able to get away with that. Unlike Logan, that has two scrubbers, and so they needed two uh, two point transmitters. And luckily, you know, we have been testing out uh, the uh, what we call the dirty two point transmitters at these locations. Um, this is an access point right at the uh, outlet of the scrubber before the bag house that you can actually uh, pull that door open and, and go inside there. So we put the probes right there. And this, uh, you guys have all seen this uh, Primex Dirty Dew Point probe. So this is a first time use at Carney's and we are looking to eventually move operation uh, for dew point control to these um, probes. And Logan has been using the exact same probe for a good five plus years easily. And, uh, you know, you have a local display and now that's also being fed into the control system as well. Um, I mentioned earlier about a little uh, PLC network upgrade here to uh, mimic what was done at the flagship earlier. And what, I know it's a busy drawing, but uh, what that allows us to do is move operation of a lot of the back end equipment up to the control room. In the past, uh, you know, it was all local. Uh, the operators, you know, went out there and they operated, you know, slakers and all from 
from down here locally. And now they've been able to put that up into the control room and the operator can get a lot more information than he ever had before. Of our big uh, projects this year, you can see this is the original uh, Slaker uh, vent piping and it goes off to the, to the side there. And these are pretty long uh, piping runs. And what would tend to happen is you'd get a lot of water vapor uh, floating around, especially in the uh, winter months. Um, and it would really make for a kind of a rough environment in there for guys to, uh, you know, do maintenance work and uh, operate the equipment. Uh, what we found, you can see a lot of buildup inside of that uh, vent piping. So the fans just were not doing the, the job that uh, they should have been. And so we went to a, uh, a flexible uh, hose, metal hose here, stainless, that uh, if we need to, we can just take it out and replace it without uh, a lot of time down. And uh, you can see uh, this highly detailed engineering sketch of what uh, we conceived, you know, that, that it was going to look like here with uh, bigger fans. And then... Here's the uh, finished product. And this is actually a shot taken before anything was ever hooked up. Uh, it was just naturally venting out without any additional uh, uh, fan to pull, to pull it from. And then here's the finished setup here at the end. So we brought, a, brought the fans closer basically to where the, uh, the vents were and it's, it's worked out pretty good. Okay, um, had a lot of buildup issues with the uh, lime slurry tanks at Carney's, and uh, this has been a problem for, for quite a while. And the, the solution to this problem, and they, they still had the original uh, three bladed mixing uh, going on here. We put in these uh, four bladed, uh, what they call hydrofoil type mixers. Uh, and from the moment they went in, you know, the guys were amazed. You could see the changes in the turbulence inside of the, uh, the tanks and much, much better mixing. Um, you know, you've got baffles inside there, as you can see in the background, but it, it was just not cutting it. And you can also see the buildup on the blades. So basically, uh, you know, the mixing was occurring in one little area, and then you just had a channel running over to where the pump was. So a lot of the lime slurry settled out and was not trained. So uh, we're hoping that that is going to really improve our operation there. Um, in order to do this particular project, we had to change out the gearboxes. We had to pull new cables in because they were bigger motors. So a little more expense than just changing out the, uh, the mixing blades like we did up at Logan. And then, you know, here's a shot of the new uh, gearbox on top. So, um, Everybody was uh, very happy about this project, especially this guy who had to go in there to clean it out. Um, typically what was gonna happen, we were gonna have to send people in, um, shovel and vacuum it out and to clean it out. And that typically would happen about twice a year on, on each tank. And that also led to a lot of wasted lime that we just threw away. Um, Another project uh, actually to kind of uh, replicate what was there near the beginning uh, are some three-way return valves. We haven't installed them yet, but the idea is the, uh, the, uh, each scrubber has its own loop of lime slurry. And there are times when you had to take the, uh, the tank out of service or pumps weren't working or, or what have you. So again, one of these highly detailed engineering sketches that I uh, did from home uh, and we're going to allow now that they'll have the ability to divert the return flow to either tank from, from either system. So this will give operations a lot of flexibility. And this is a project that actually came from uh, the operators and uh, we just implemented it. Okay. Um, here are the, uh, Slaker automation, part of that project, in order to do it, we had to add uh, block valves. Um, 
and, and new control valves as well, um, similar to the uh, style that we use up at, at Logan. So this is a before shot, and then here's your after shot. Uh, brand new valves going in there. They're not covered in lime slurry just yet, but uh, we did this uh, project. Uh, we pulled cables in with a contractor, and then our own plant guys did the final hookup. And then we had our INC contractor uh, remotely access through the new PLC network. We had them remotely access the PLCs. They wrote the ladder logic, they loaded it, tested it, and they did that all from off site. So, um, with the idea that, uh, you know, people are not traveling as much, we have uh, the ability to keep uh, moving forward with our uh, projects here. And then, uh, you know, that's just a, the, the new uh, graphic uh, that is up in the control room for that particular project. And again, you know, the operators have access to uh, information that they didn't before. How am I doing on uh, time, somebody? All right. Chad, it's about 1040. Yeah, you, you got the floor. Still good? Man. Still good? Okay, man. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. Because I, I, I'm getting no feedback here from <laughs> so it's tough to do. All right. So another project we did uh, up at up at the scrubber, we have uh, strainers up there, and typically, you know, the operators will isolate one side and clean them, and then you know flip it over. And what was happening is uh, the operators, I think, had their their weedies uh, in the morning, and then uh, they tend to over tighten the valves, and then they break the gearbox on it. And so we put in uh, actuators there, and then the operator just has to move a, a lever and open and close the valve. And so that solved that problem with uh, out a lot of fanfare. So just a, a good little fix for us. Um, we are continuing to uh, install corrosion coupons and pull them out. We do it at a less uh, frequent interval, but you can see here from uh, Bag House One that uh, you know our average is just about the same as it's been you know, for the past several years since we started monitoring and you can see we've been doing it for 10 years so a lot of good data there uh, same thing on unit two almost identical not a, not a whole lot of difference as far as the uh, the averages go um, we continue to you know to have areas that we have to patch and uh, and uh, coat to, to try and get us to the end but uh, uh, overall it hasn't fallen down yet and then up at the road at Logan, uh, same sort of thing, continuing to monitor um, different areas of the plant, uh, you know, the bag house outlet, the, uh, the reactor inlets. Um, so we're getting there. We're getting there. It's still, it's still holding together. And then this is a, for everybody that's never seen one, this is a typical setup for a bag house coupon. It has this uh, Teflon holder to insulated from the uh, the structure and then a graph which a number of people have seen uh, in in the past and it's this constant battle of maintenance uh, operations and engineering about where to run the unit and deal with the uh, savings that you get from reducing your lime usage versus the damage that you know you're going to do uh, to the bags and to the bag house and the rest of the uh, the ductwork, so it's a continuous continuous game of uh, monitoring and trying to uh, make sure we hit the sweet spot there. Okay, um, I'll let you guys uh, read through this uh, this fun fact, and I know that when this is done, you're all going to go to Google Earth and see if you can find this spot in uh, Texas. It is there, and just kind of an interesting. Uh, tidbit there where this guy uh you know farm that you know farm that into his uh, land and you can actually see it so and since we're uh not going to have a uh a dry scrubber uh golf outing this year just a quick shout out to brett dan and dave you know hot damn and uh hopefully we get to play next year and this year uh we are COVID 19 ready so um, I think we're going to take the questions at the end. Uh, so I need to uh, end this.
And you guys, do I think I, do I click on stop sharing and I think I'm clear? Yeah. Hey, John, okay. I'll throw you one quick softball just because it did come in and it was very specific to one of your slides. But somebody wants to know what type of coating was used in the bag house that was pictured on the slide and how long has the coating been in service? Oof. Um, it's the it's the Duramar coating. Um, uh, I'm gonna say that it's been in service at least five or six years. It's probably longer than that. We did some extensive uh, coating projects, you know, a couple compartments every outage uh, back in the early 2000s. So I, that specific compartment, I'd I'd have to check to see. So we we can do that. I don't know how we'll feed that data back, but uh, we can check that for you. Fantastic. Yeah, if, uh, if you're able to supply some additional information, uh, I know it was from another utility, so um, they're probably pretty interested maybe in, in some of their management. But yeah, that's not you. To, you know, that's not to say that there's anything wrong with that that coating. It's it's done a great job for us. But, uh, you know, you start getting into temperature extremes uh, on, you know, in different compartments, it, you know, it's, it's not that the coating isn't going to last. It's just, you know, it's going to fail at some point in time. Sure, good clarification there. Cool. Yeah, we do have some other questions, but I think they're they're better for the end. Um, that was just okay. the one specific that popped up during your your presentation. Okay. All right. Well, uh, we'll move on to to Mr. Craig Henry. Um, so Craig is a maintenance superintendent down at uh, John W. Turk Power Plant. He's been 42 years with AEP, so he's well beyond the Gold Watch territory covering various positions within operations and maintenance. Uh, he began his career in 1978 at Welsh Power Plant, uh, a three unit, 1500 megawatt PRB burning coal units. Um, in 91, he transferred to Wilkes and Lone Star plants, four units uh, with about 900 megawatts of gas and oil. Um, in, in 2010, he uh, assumed a position at Turk uh, during construction. Uh, his wife and, uh, and, and Craig have three daughters, three granddaughters, and two grandsons. Uh, he enjoys deer hunting, traveling, and anything else fun. So, uh, Craig, always, uh, always uh, great to see your face and always a big smile there. So, uh, with that, I'll, I'll kick it over to you and, uh, and let you run with the ball. Is it up now? Yep, you're up on stage. All right, well, I'm just going to give you a little rundown uh, of the uh, design of the plant, a little background, and I'm going to turn it over to the our my maintenance supervisor that's over the air quality control system to go through some of the upgrades that we've done. But yes, welcome. Uh, this is... Turk Power Plant. We're located in Southwest Arkansas. We went online commercially in 2012, and I hate to say it, but as of right now, we're the last fossil fuel plant built in the United States. Hopefully one of these days it'll change, but as of right now, we're in. Uh, this design plant, I know of none others like us in the United States or in North America. There's some in China, one in Australia. I know they just commissioned one in, in the Philippines. It's a little bit smaller. It's a, a kind of a, it's a 400 megawatt, we're 650, but they just finished commissioning it here in the last few months. Uh, like I said, we're in Southwest Arkansas. We're right at the joint where Texas, Arkansas, Oklahoma, and uh, Louisiana all come together. We're within 40 miles of uh, any of those four states. A little background on this uh, unit. After we built it, the, uh, we had our, uh, we did a boiler hydro in uh, October of 11. The hydro was, uh, was complete in uh, December of 11. We did a major contract change in July of 2012, where we bought out the company that built the unit and we assume the commissioning of the plant. Well, the first fire was in August of 2012. Our main steam blows were com 
completed in September of 12. There were 566 total sting blows to clean it up. The reheat blows were completed also in September. There was 270 uh, reheat blows. First coal fire was October 12. We sink for the very first time November of 12. We went once through with the boiler on November of 12. We went COD in December of 20th of 2012. And from first fire to COD was, was one day short of four months. And this was originally scheduled for nine months. So there was a lot of uh, fantastic work by contractors, company employees to, uh, to turn this into a COD, uh, a COD of four months, which we have not been able to find where any plant had ever been commissioned that fast. The plant design, we're a nominal 624, we can get 650. See the steam conditions, 35, 15 PSI, the 11, 15 main steam, 11, 25 reheat. That's where the super, the ultra super critical comes from that uh, anything over 1,050, the ultra super critical, no. I may be wrong on that. Anyway, we're ultra super critical because of our temperatures, the design, uh, generator turbine is Austin 4K and tandem compound at high efficient. If we have a welded rotor design for a very quick startup. The steam generator and the uh, AQCS is BMW. We have a uh, anhydrous ammonia for our SCR with no bypass on our spray dry absorber. We use pebble lime recycle ash. We have a 10 compartment pulse jet fabric filter and a FL Smith activated carbon injection for mercury control. The uh, design features were the Shaw CBI had the balance of the plant, the pipe and the coal system, cooling towers, and the B&W built the B&W built the boiler and AQCS. It was a kind of an, a different setup during construction. We had a, a union side, which was B&W and a non-union that was Shaw that built the plant simultaneously and it actually went extremely well. Uh, we have a eight feet water heater stages and we have a heart design, which is, is a heater over reheat pressure. That's where we get a lot of our efficiency at. Uh, we have flow serve boiler feed pump. We have a motor driven at 30%. And then we have a uh, main boiler feed pump, pump that is driven by an Austin steam turbine, 16 cell cooling tire. We have a turbine bypass system that has 30% capacity, which was a, has been a really great addition because of the stainless steel superheater and the exfoliation with the bypass. We actually can clean the exfoliation out, blow it to the condenser where the turbine blades never see it, which is really is going to add a lot of life to our turbine. They have an Emerson Ovation DCS controls. And during startup, we decided to build or have a high fidelity simulator built and installed on site for training. And that was another reason that the commissioning went extremely well and extremely quick. You see the boiler is an ultra super critical PRB pulverized coal balance draft went through Benson type boiler with spiral wound furnace. You see we have vertical steam separator, a water collection tank, and a boiler surf pump. We have no division valves. The water collecting tank actually acts as a drum on startup. And uh, we go once through about 32% load and reach a super critical around 70% load. And uh, if we move the load, slide the load up and down, we actually go from super critical back to subcritical. Our steam flow is 4,419,000. Like I said, the 3675 at 1115, reheats 1125. Uh, the boiler is made up of uh, some of it is kind of exotic. We're one of the few. We do a lot of work with EPRI on the life to try to uh, determine the life of the, our material. But our super eats and platens are 347H stainless. We have a uh, P91, P92 headers. The reheat outlet banks are 347H and HFG stainless tubes. 
the mainstream piping is uh, 92 and re uh, piping is 91. Now this is where we get interesting. Our air permits are the most stringent in the country that we know of. They went out when they built our air permit and found the most stringent uh, air permits around and we got the most stringent of everything. And I'm happy to say with our design, we have not had much trouble meeting our uh, design criteria or our limits. Some of our, uh, we have, you can notice on here that we have a lot of, uh, you know, six minute uh, limits. We have 30 day limits. We got uh, one day limit, 24 day limit, 20, uh, 12 month limits and they all add up. So we spend a lot of time maintaining and making sure that we're gonna be able to meet our limits and maintain below our limits. And so here's the, the layout of the plant from the left to the right, boiler. Uh, like you see, if you look real close at the main furnishing, you see, see that we're spiral wound. Right below the arch, we come out into the mixed bottle headers, and then we go straight vertical. Come out, air, uh, SCR, air heater, to the SBA, bag house, ID fans, and then the stack is on the far right. We have redundant uh, lime slakers and recycled ash tanks. The spray dry absorber is, uh, we have the single Niro's uh, atomizers. We do have four on site, we have two in service and the other two in operational rotation where we'll have a spare plus one if we're doing maintenance. So we've done a lot of work on the time that we it takes us to change these, to swap atomizers out online. Uh, they've done a fantastic job on that. Bag house, is, like I said, it's 10 compartment, uh, 12,400 bags. And uh, that's kind of the layout of the plant. I'm gonna hand it off to uh, Daryl now. Awesome. Let me uh, let me give Daryl's bio here while he's uh, getting his uh, his slides ready. So Daryl Jacobs, he's a mechanical maintenance supervisor of AQCS, Air Quality Control Systems. Uh, at John W. Turk Power Plant, uh, which is part of AEP and SWEPCO. Uh, he's worked at SWEPCO uh, his entire 38-year career, so he's definitely in Gold Watch territory as well. Um, 1982, he started work at the Perky uh, Power Plant. Um, they burnt lignite and had a wet scrubber. Uh, he was on Unit 1, it looks like, about 650 megawatts. In uh, 1994, he transferred over to Wilkes Lone Star um, on the natural gas fuel oil units. Um, and then in uh, 2010, he, uh, he joined up uh, Turk Power Plant, um, which burns PRB, has a dry scrubber, and is about uh, 600 megawatts on Unit 1. So with that, I'll kick it over to Daryl. Good morning. Trying to get this into full view here. Okay, so uh, Daryl Jacobs, and I'm uh, air quality control system maintenance supervisor, mechanical maintenance supervisor, and uh, I just want to thank y'all for having me today, and uh, I was going to go over some of our improvements that we've, uh, we've done since uh, we've been in commissioning. I did have a, a presentation last year and some of these slides are from last year and some are new. Uh, start out our, our uh, some of our first improvements we did was on uh, our Suico recycle ash slurry vibrating grit screens. Uh, we had trouble with premature wear on our screens and uh, problems with buildup and blockage. And so we, tried to build us a diffuser that would uh, help us remedy this problem. And we built it out of eight inch PVC. It worked 
pretty good, but we still had wear problems. Uh, we have since went to the a new style diffuser that we received from uh, Suico, and we installed this, and we we have a uh, short we have lengthened our screen life with this diffuser. Uh, we still think we can do a little bit better. I need to work with Suico on uh, possibly some changes on the screens. But you can see it's a, it's a little bit smaller diffuser. Uh, it's a lot lighter, easier to, to uh, clean out if you get a problem with it plugging. Uh, we've also added new flow nozzles or clean out the screen clean nozzles. Uh, they do a real good job. We added a new, uh, a totally new bar back behind the, the diffuser also to, to assist with keeping it clean back there. Uh, but this was right after we did our, our change out and uh, it's, done, it's done very well. Uh, some other things that we did were uh, we moved hey, all Dad, of our hoses. Some, of ho some of our hoses were run into the inside the grit screen and we moved all of our hoses outside. The reason being uh, we use pressure washers to clean our, our grit screens uh, daily and uh, the pressure washers were pretty hard on the hoses and we were having to replace them quite often. So as you can see the picture to the right, all of our hoses are mounted on the outside. They go directly into the header and those are uh, stainless steel square tubing headers now too. So uh, we don't hey, have Darryl? any plugs in the headers. Yes. Yeah, hey, this is Dave Kahn. Uh, we can still see your title slide, so uh, I don't think anybody can see those diffusers or those hoses. There we go. I was on, I was on the wrong one there. Thank Not you. Not a problem. You're good now. Okay. All right, so this is our new style, new revision that we did to the grit screen there where we put our hoses on the outside and uh, no longer have a problem with pressure washers. Uh, we also added a clean out there on the left. That's the, that's the diffuser, uh, inlet diffuser. Uh, sometimes they do get plugged and we take that cap off and we're able to clean it out with a pressure washer. Uh, during that time, we added uh, a new lubrication system, automatic lubrication system. Uh, and it's from Chesterton. It's doing a real good job also. Uh, we added new uh, skirting along the bottom. Uh, you can see that red skirting there in the right. Uh, we had problems with our rubber. It would get flimsy and it would just fall back. Uh, we used, uh, we kind of did a little rigging there. We, we used conveyor, conveyor skirting for that. It's a lot thicker. It doesn't that doesn't fall back whenever it gets whenever it gets built up on it. And then on the end, we added a, a rubber skirting there. We had some problem with uh, our skirting was uh, our water was coming out the end when it was spraying. So we added that to, that little skirt there to divert the water down to the recycle ash uh, screw conveyor. So we've done some uh, revisions on our lime slurry vibrating grit screens. These are Suico grit screens also. Uh, as you can see, uh, normally uh, it only has two layers uh, on the sides here. And uh, we added another layer uh, on the side. And uh, this is this gives us extra room for our diffuser that we used in inside. Uh, you can see the top is also, it, it didn't have but two ports in it, and we added two more ports. These were added to uh, help clean whenever the operators go up there for inspection and cleaning. Uh, so it's got four ports on it. We also, you can, you notice it's bolted together in the center. 
that that's to make it for easy removal. We had to do this revision. Uh, Suico said they couldn't do that for us, so we uh, we did cut it down the center and made it where it bolts together. It's easier to remove. This is our our new style diffuser that we put in there. We did not even we didn't have a diffuser inside our our grit screens, and uh, we were having trouble with premature wear again on the lime grit screens and. Uh, You'll see the it's basically the same, just a little bit smaller than the one that we have on our uh, recycle ash grit screens. And just below that, just below that diffuser, you'll see a disc. It's a metal disc that uh, we went, we got in contact with Suico. Uh, that's where our wear, we was having most of our wear was right there in the center where it comes in, and and they fabricate this grit screen for us now and it's got that disc uh, made on it and you can see kind of vaguely in the outside uh, around the outside of the screen it's like a two inch rubber barrier and uh it's thin it's thin so that the, the scants still go across it and uh we were having premature wear along the edges too and they they fabricate that with the with the screen now Okay, uh, this is our lime Dabian discharge. Uh, this is what feeds the where we feed our lime slakers. Uh, we started out with the, the expansion joint on the left. It's a slip-on expansion joint held in place by uh, two hose clamps, and uh, we had a, a bad feeling that we were going to have problems there. We already had a problem with our recycle ash uh, expansion joints that was built like this. So we uh, we went with a, a flange bolt uh, expansion joint to try to keep from having a problem there. This is our uh, manway entry into our lime slaker. And uh, this is a platform right above that manway, and it's probably about five foot uh, to the bottom of the of the platform. And my guys were having to get up underneath there and try to handle this door. The doors, the door probably weighs about 180 to 200 pounds, and uh, it was a pretty good load for them. And you can think about them; they're having to bend over and and handle this door. And so uh, they come up with this slide bar that uh, helps support that door, and it takes the weight off of off of them, and possibly prevents back back injuries there. Uh, on our lime slaker feeders, uh, it's a rotary airlock feeder. Uh, we had some problems with buildup within the airlock itself on the rotor. And uh, every time you you needed to clean the airlock, you'd have to open a door there just below it, and uh, it is interlocked with uh, that would it would trip the, the feeder so that we couldn't make make slurry and uh, clean it at the same time. So my guys come up with just adding a little port down below there. It's a two inch port. And we we got us an air hose, rigged it up with a nozzle, and uh, you can see that tennis ball on there. At first, we just had that flat disc on there, and and when they were trying to clean, it would kind of spray out the the dust would spray out on them, and and they asked if we could do something better. So we added that tennis ball, and it makes it where you can kind of pivot that nozzle and uh, help clean the. The rotor. That's a picture of the rotor there on the right, and uh, that air nozzle. It only sticks in there so far. We made sure that whenever it sticks in to clean that rotor, that it can't get into it while it's running. So uh, that helped us there. So this is a drawing of our recycle ash storage silo. Uh, in the past, we've had problems with flow. Uh, we've had problems with some of the discharge valves and feeders 
fluidization. So uh, what we have, we've done several things to our recycle ash silo. Uh, to start out, uh, when we wanted, to, when we needed to get in there because of flow problem, we had to uh, we had to vacuum it out, and we did not have a manhole there, so we fabricated a manhole, put it right at the bottom, and makes it easier to get into and clean out. Since since we fabricated this, uh, we've also installed a smaller uh, flange there on that flange. So that it doesn't have that's like a 24 inch pipe, and we put like a eight or 10 inch flange on there so that you don't have to open up the, the whole flange to clean it out. You can just open up the smaller one, vacuum till you get down and get it down lower. Uh, you can also see one of our hoses right there. Uh, that's that's our that's our fluidization nozzles. That's where they go in the bottom of the or the sides of the cone. Uh, we had problems with uh, cleaning out the, the recycle ash silo, and it would it would be still build up a little bit. So we installed these vibrators on the outside, and to, you know whenever we're running our uh, rotary feeder down there. We could kick these on, and it it did a good job of uh, getting our tank empty, so that we could get inside, and we we wouldn't have to vacuum as much. It would feed out most all the way. Uh, this is kind of a blurry picture, but we just had small nozzles like we had in the cone on the very bottom, all, and that that was one of our problems. We thought was uh, causing our flow problems uh, feeding. So we uh, we have these these uh, tray fluidizers here and they're like 12 inches by 42 inches long. We installed seven of them. And since we have installed these uh, tray fluidizers, they, uh, we have not had any flow problems in the bottom. It is a flat bottom silo there the cone comes down and it's just flat on the very bottom okay so this is a picture of the very bottom of the silo as you can see i said it was flat there so uh, we've when when the silo was engineered it was engineered with one discharge valve and if we had a problem it is a, it was an actuated valve and uh if we had a problem with that actuated valve, we couldn't shut anything off. So <clears throat> we purchased a 16 inch uh, hand operated manual O port, <clears throat> O port, excuse me, valve there just above the actuated valve. And we did have problems with the actuated valve also with packing. Uh, it operates uh, probably. 25 to 50 times a day, depending on your load. Uh, so it actuates. We we have to feed a lot. You know, we we make batches of, uh, of recycle ash, and every time it shuts off and cuts back on, that knife gate had to operate, and we were having to adjust that packing. Uh, probably, <clears throat> I'd say daily. And then we installed these, uh, it's called live load packing. What it is is uh, Belleville washers. And uh, it's, you know, it just puts a tension on your packing, keeps it, keeps it uh, adjusted. And now we, we only have to adjust our packing on that knife gate about once a month if we have to do it that often. Uh, this is just below that that uh, knife gate there. This is our recycle ash feeder. I was telling you about uh, we had the slip-on expansion joint. Uh, we did have one of these expansion joints that uh, blew out, come loose, and we filled our reagent building full of ash, and luckily it all stayed inside the building. 
there wasn't an environmental issue there but when we did when we had that problem we we knew we had to come up with a remedy and uh just to the right there we installed a, a new flanged expansion joint for for that also and we haven't had any problems there since then so whenever we did have that ash leak uh this is right on top of our our recycle ash slurry tank uh we did make an emergency egress from this area because if someone was on top of this tank and we did have an ash leak they would ha they would have gone up the stairs and then probably another uh 40 50 foot and whenever it's full of ash you you can't see so we made this emergency egress to come off the it comes off the top of recycle ash uh, slurry tanks and as you can see to the far right it goes outside the building and they can get out of the ash real quick and can come down the ladder next we uh we also installed a, a platform this this is on on our re reagent building here we had some equipment that we could not get out of the building it's on the second floor we had to install a new roll-up door and platform there so we can get a crane and and get our equipment out of the building uh, this is our recycle ash mixed tank drain this is how it was engineered whenever it was built and you can see all the curves that whenever they went to drain that tank uh, that sometimes we a lot of the times we'd have problems with it stopping up and my guys would have to go up there and, and rod that drain out and and it was just always a pain a pain point for us and uh, we looked into a different style drain valve uh, this is called a shoof drain valve and it's a it's called a six by four because it has a six inch uh, inlet there and a four inch outlet uh, it's been a very good valve for us it mounts directly to the bottom of the tank uh, the seat is welded into the bottom of the tank and and as you can see in this drawing right after here the seat it shuts off inside the tank so that uh, you don't have any trouble with plugage the only time you have trouble with plugage is if that if that valve plug leaks by leaks by on the seat and we haven't had that much problem with with those valves a very good investment for that valve my guys uh, operations does not have to call us to to drain the tanks anymore so that that was good for us uh, this next slide is uh, our slurry pumps uh, basically our lime and recycle ash are set up the same way uh, we have three recycle ash slurry pumps and two lime slurry pumps uh, this platform was not here when we started my guys were having to work off of ladders and uh, they we had some uh, near misses on that just working off the ladder so uh, we engineered a, a new platform to go up there so that they could work on the, the higher level valving and not have to work off a ladder and it's very good so this is our slurry slurry pumps we had trouble with uh, our belts having to adjust them all the time and and it was uh to adjust the belts was just about an inch and a quarter bolt and uh or four bolts you know you'd have to adjust the belt tension with the bolts and nuts and we come up with the hydraulic belt tensioners this is a warming style uh pump and it's warming also makes the uh, hydraulic belt adjusters uh, very good investment a lot safer less pinch points uh, quick a real quick adjustment and uh, you can uh, you can adjust them with them running but we usually get it shut down but it, it makes it 
it makes it real nice on belt adjustments there. Uh, this is our bottom. We call it the flapper door on the bottom of our SDA tower. Uh, it has to let air. We have to let air in the bottom of our our SDA tower. It, and uh, we was having problems with getting enough air. We was having fallout, and we worked with engineering. We started by cutting holes in the bottom door, uh, and it got to where it was. We just got tired of cutting holes in it, so we we installed these jacking bolts, as you can see there on the side. Uh, those jacking bolts, you can adjust them in and out, and it opens opens uh, the door a little more, letting more air in. Uh, it's worked out real well for us. This is on our uh, SDA penthouse and reagent building areas. Uh, we have had problems in the past with our drains plugging up in the head tanks, floor drains, all different drains of our drains had trouble with them plugging up just because of slurry getting in there, drying, and then over time it would build up. <clears throat> we installed a uh, process water to all of our drains and it flows you know, we adjust it. We throttle those uh, lines to let water in those drains all the time. It keeps the lines flushed out. Works really well, really well for us. We used to have to get a, the hydro blasting contractors to come out there, and and they would have to hydro blast our drains for us, even even while we were running on the head tanks, and it just it was a pain. Uh, one of our pain points that we had, and and uh, one of my guys suggested that, so we installed it, and it has really, really paid off a lot. Uh, you know, our process water, we reuse, reuse it a lot around the plant, so it's uh, it's worked out really well. Keeps our drains clean. Uh, this is also our lines running. If you this ramp here is is how our lines run out of our head tank back down to the slurry tanks. Uh, all that beam structure was there. Uh, when we had uh, our hydro blasting crews would have to come out, we would have to scaffold this area for them to work off of or either work out of a man basket. And what we did, we just went and added handrail and uh, grading so that uh, we could walk up and down that ramp and clean those lines and it's it's paid off to work real well. Like Craig mentioned earlier, we uh, we started out with three atomizers, and uh, we had uh, what we call uh, a storage stand and a work stand. And when we got our fourth atomizer uh, for spare, we had to have another another stand that we could use to. Uh, so that we could remove one and still have a stand to put it in. And they come up with this uh, rolling stand. And this uh, is basically the same stand that we, we work our atomizers off of, but this, this stand will roll out underneath the crane or hoist that you see there. And we can set it on there, roll it back out of the way. Uh, we just use like a winch to move it back and forth it's worked really good too. Uh, on our atomizer motors, we've had problems with the uh, motor connectors. Uh, we changed out, uh, this is the second style uh, motor connector that we have. It's a 4KV motor connector. Uh, first one we had was like a, a real fine threaded uh, connector once you plugged it in you had to, to screw that connector together uh, the fine threads made it real tough we tried a, a coarser thread to see if it would work better and we finally ended up using this uh, quarter turn connector it it saves time and uh, another pain point you know because of uh, just how it gets tight and it didn't want to really 
tighten up enough, but this quarter turn is really working out really well for disconnecting and connecting those motors. On our uh, atomizers, whenever we uh, do have to change our lube oil filters, as some of y'all may know, uh, when you go to take that canister off, you get a little bit of oil and it gets all over everything and uh, makes it real slick. Uh, we knurled the outside just with a lathe and put a knurling on the outside of the canister, makes it easier to, to grip even if it's got oil on it. Uh, atomizer wheel installation. So uh, it was all manhandling or either trying to use uh, this uh, jack without that apparatus mounted on it. Uh, when we, we, my guys come up with this and it mounts directly to like a car jack, you can see there. And it's, it's, that wheel sits on there. It stays level when you go to lift it up. It makes it seat off real well, and you can, it's got, you know, clearance underneath where you can get your nut on even when you got it jacked up there. Uh, we've also added uh, some catwalks and platforms around the plant. The, the one to the, the one on the left is our, that's our atomizer feed line. Uh, we had problems with that elbow there, that rubber elbow you can see. Uh, we had trouble with it blowing off and we got that new elbow style. It's both in, but to get out and work on that elbow, we had to scaffold out there every time. So we built that new scaffold to get to that elbow. The one in the center, uh, that walkway used to come out, you come out of the elevator, that's right there at the edge of the elevator. If you take a right, a hard right, that's how wide it used to be, like maybe six foot wide and we just uh widen that platform so it makes it easier to get our barrels of oil up there to the atomizers uh, sda penthouse the one on the right is our uh atomizer feed slurry feed control valve it's a fujikin valve we would have to work on it every now and then and uh that that platform didn't come out as far towards us as it as it is right now uh, we added that platform a little extension there to make it easier to work on and this is the last slide this is our atomizer visual management board it has uh, you can see the large board there it has each atomizer listed uh, it has whether the, what the status is whether it's ready to run whether it's being worked on uh, where if it is uh, installed, it says it gives a location, the install date, all information anyone would have a question about on it. Uh, it also has some uh, pain points there at the bottom. Uh, that's uh, it's just a very to me. I, I like it because someone not knowing the area that much can walk up there and look at our atomizers, see which one's in and see how, how it's performing. Uh, that was a, I think it was a very good addition to our area up there. And I believe that's all I have. Awesome. Excellent. Well, uh, we do have a couple of questions that have rolled in. Uh, a couple of these are specific to um, to both Daryl and Craig's uh, presentation. So I'll fire those off first. And then we do have some um, other questions that were sent in by uh, attendees uh, prior to this uh, these slides. So uh, we'll get into those. So somebody wants to know, you, you talked about the Lime Day Bin Expansion Joint connection, uh, the switch to bolted, uh, and they want to yeah. know what gave you a bad feeling about those original bands, and has the band slipped or come loose? Uh, so our bands, 
uh, we did not have a problem on the lime. Our first problem that we had was on uh, recycle ash. And yes, the band, uh, the, the joint did slip down. Uh, the band, we figured it come loose. We weren't there when it happened, but it, the joint did slip down and it let the ash come out. Uh, we did not have a problem with lime, though. We were just trying to be a little preventative there. Awesome. Um, all right. The other questions I have here that looks like that people have, have uh, put in are, are really, um, you know, pretty much industry-wide, so it, it kind of covers a bunch of you guys. Um, so we do have some pre-recorded questions, so I'm going to jump to John Kirsch um and and chat with him john you still here i am all right cool um john it says during 1990 and early 2000s sda ash generated from carney's point power station was hauled back to a mine in pennsylvania for use in mine reclamation what is the current ash management practice uh, the current practice is that uh, all of the ash is either landfilled or uh, the conditioned ash, I should say. Uh, there was a permit change in PA uh, a ways back. And so because of the, uh, I think it was the chloride content in the fly ash, we were no longer allowed to uh, send it back to PA, either to landfill or for uh, mine reclamation. So. It's now currently being landfilled in New Jersey if it's conditioned and if it's taken away dry, our ash hauler has a, uh, a use. I think they use it to make cinder blocks uh, locally. Hopefully that answers that. Cool. Yeah. Um, any changes to operations or how work with outside contra contractors due to COVID restrictions um, you know, have impacted uh, long-term O&M practices, and that's probably for the whole gang. So, you know, talk maybe about how COVID-19 uh, restrictions with outside contractors have impacted your your practices. Well, I'll go first. Uh, Logan and Carney's, you know, they do a, uh, uh, you know, temperature check, and they have a little sheet they have to fill out, you know, about whether they're sick or not. And, of course, everybody's masked up. Um, all the time, uh, especially if they go, say, to the control room, you know, to do lockout, tag out, or, or whatever. Um, we've had one or two incidents where uh, one case uh, was a uh, early on in the uh, pandemic, a, a janitor uh, tested positive, and so we had to quarantine a whole operating shift. And then there was another case where uh, it was a truck driver uh, dropping off some equipment. Um, uh, the contractor, after he had been on both sites, actually, um, he uh, we were contacted by his company and told that he had tested positive. So everybody who had come into contact with him, you know, of course, uh, quarantined and or got tested. So uh, we've been dealing with it. Um, we've we've tried to block out um, a lot of vendor contacts. You know, instead of them coming on site, uh, you know, doing presentations or whatnot, we're doing that remotely. So that's that's really about it. So far, so good. You know, we've we've been lucky. We've dodged all the bullets. Yeah, this is Craig at uh, at Turk. We had a mat inspection that we had to to do this spring during the you know full blown COVID, which is still around. But we did a uh, we changed up our onboarding or the orientation where we used to bring the contractors in as a group, uh, do them in one of our meeting rooms. So we started, we would meet at their their job site, trying to be outdoors if the weather permitted. Uh, and we did our onboarding, the orientation there on site. During outage, instead of the contractors going back to their uh, their location, their, their group lunch room, we ended up building uh, shacks up on the boiler for the boiler crew. We had different areas that were set aside. We tried to keep the work groups uh, together where they weren't mixed and matched on a daily basis. So they took their breaks, their lunch, and everything at their their work site. 
just like John said, they had the, uh, you know, we did temperature checks, uh, questionnaires on their health. And at one time, I think we had 125 contractors on site and we did not have a one case of COVID come up during that time. Now, being around the plants pretty close to Texarkana, which is a regional health uh, area, there's two large hospitals. Several of the employees' wife, wives or, or children's involved with the medical field. So there's been some uh, isolating that we've had to do for some people that were exposed at home you know, and had a 14 day of quarantine, but we've been extremely lucky, I'd say, because of the uh, regional health, the the possibility of being exposed, and we've not had a really that bad of a, a, a problem with, it. you know, of course, we wear our, anytime that we're outside our office, we have our, our face mask on, the guys all wear bandanas or neck gaiters when they can't, uh, be outside of the six foot uh, social distancing and everybody's really at first it, it it was a learning curve just like it is for everybody but after it became the norm it's really not that big a deal anymore this is daryl only only thing i have to add to that is uh we have two rotations on uh we have three maintenance crews mechanical maintenance crews here two rotations on each crew and uh, each rotation uh, has a different break time, different lunch time. Uh, also in the mornings, we had a kind of a small meeting room that we used to meet, meet in as, as my group. And uh, I have like eight guys on my crew, two on two on each row, uh, four on each rotation. And uh, so we would, we met in a larger room uh, distance ourselves uh one rotation on one side of the room another rotation on the other side of the room and just had the social distancing of the crews and that's that's about the only difference of what craig's talking about that we've done excellent um and i know we're we're close to being out of time or maybe a few minutes over so uh we do have other questions but we'll get those answered by the um by the uh the presenters but we'll we'll give you one more uh quick and dirty one before we all leave you know, what is the the biggest lesson learned uh from the past year for each one of your plants and 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 uh co-workers there john you want to start us off yeah okay uh I think that uh, you know these plants, since they have a, a finite life, you know, remaining uh, with them, is that uh, you need to still um, keep after um, making improvements, you know, to the operation. They, you know, it's just it's a it's an ongoing thing. You, you can't stop. You you know the, you, you got to find better ways to do things and and. We've been very fortunate in that our owner has uh, been more than willing to, uh, you know, have us spend some money um, to keep the uh, plants up and running. I think that's about the best I can say it. Yeah, uh, I agree with what John said. I think also, you know, we're, we're kind of at the, the front end of our life, but we've always stressed to the, you know, the employees to, uh, if you see something, say something. If you need something, ask for it. Uh, come up with something better all the time. We're we're still pushing that. We're you know we we talk it, we breathe it all the time. But uh, you know you can't get into a norm. We were we have always been in a norm of how we did things. We you know how we come to work, how we act at work. And all of a sudden, 2020 came around with the COVID, and the whole world turned upside down. And I guess we, we've all learned that the norm is never going to remain the norm. You know, when we come out of this, it will probably be a new norm. And more than likely down the road, that new norm is going to change again. So, you, you know, you gotta, can't ever get your, your feet stuck in the mud. you got to be able to move around and change with the times. We've all, you know, I've, I've been in it for 42 years. And when I came to the power industry, I never thought, 
I'd ever see a power plant shut down other than because it was just old and wore out and they built something better. But we're all seeing now that times are changing extremely fast. And I don't even know if we can see what the final product is going to be because it changes all the time. Only thing I'll add to that is uh, being a front front line supervisor is uh, is you know we have a lot of process improvement around this plant that we we try to use a lot and uh, my my learning is listen just be able to listen to your guys because they're the ones out there they're the ones out there doing the work and they're around it more than I am. So I just got to learn to listen and try to act on their, what they, information that they give me. That's all. Excellent. And, and Wes, I know you're here. Um, you want to share something that you guys, you know, biggest lesson learned or takeaway that you guys have had over your plants? Maybe we don't have Wes. Well, um, yes, are, can you hear me now? Yeah, there, there's Wes. I had the wrong button clicked. Yes, I'd say the biggest change we've learned in the chemical industry is is the, uh, just like you say, you can't sit on your feet. Uh, there's been so many different things have happened, uh, especially with the COVID changes in the environment and so you just always got to be looking forward excellent all right well uh jerry you still around yeah i'm still here i'm still here all right. yeah we'll uh we'll wrap this up um as dave said you know if anyone still has some questions we will um we will reach out to our presenters here and get some kind of written format and, and upload these uh, responses. We'll make sure all the questions are responded, but um, did want to say thank you to, to everyone here. Uh, John, Craig, Daryl, and Wes, you guys, um, I know you guys all prepared, appreciate your preparation time and giving us your time to talk today. It's always appreciated. You guys, as we know from hearing your bio and seeing you guys at DSUA, you've been doing this for a long time. So I think uh, I always advocate that learning from the guys who've been out there and seen it is, uh, you know, I mean, there's, there's a lot of value in your guys learning curve and we appreciate you guys sharing that with us. So, um, and, uh, thank you to Dave as well for being the moderator. You did a, did a great job, Dave. And, uh, everyone that signed up for this, um, I know I've been getting some emails in the background here. I think some folks had some issues. I know we expected probably some bugs, but I do encourage anyone listening. If you've got some feedback to provide, um, you know, we're always, continuous improvement much like all these plants right so uh, send us your feedback uh, send it to the website email it to us and uh, we're happy to follow up with anyone to make sure that the next webinar is even better than this one but um, until then we'll uh, we say thank you again and um, just continue to check the website and you know follow find us on LinkedIn and um, you guys should all know how to get a hold of us and if anyone has any specific questions or would like to get a hold of any of our presenters for some one-on-one -on -one discussion again uh you know feel free to come through the website and we'll help uh connect you guys so uh, again thank you everybody appreciate it and until next time we will uh, everyone have a good week and be safe and stay stay healthy all right take care guys <laughs>